paper's not in great shape. And um, I also want to say that I, I am recording this, so if anybody has any objections, I can like shut it off when we do the Q&A. Um, so uh, we'll see where it ends up. I, it, as papers often do, it, it bloated a bit. And um, I had to trim some parts, so we'll hope that it's relatively coherent. But it's intended to get a uh, discussion going. Although it might appear so, the term public philosophy is not particularly new. In American academia and broader culture, uses stretch back into the 20th century. Uh, for a few examples, Walter Lippmann's 1955 book, The Public Philosophy, and Noam Chomsky's 1968 article, Philosophers and Public Philosophy, figure solidly within one main sense of the term, well represented by Michael Sandel's more recent book, Public Philosophy, Essays on Morality and Politics. Like several other fields, activities, or emphases in philosophy, far before the term is coined and circulated, we can look back and see philosophers engaging in multiple ways in what we denote as public philosophy. In the last several decades, it has become a much more commonly used term, but one that's often ambiguous and, let's say, values invested and contested. So the goal of my paper is not to try to define public philosophy once or once and for all, nor at the other extreme is, am, I, am I going to suggest that public philosophy should be a term with meaning so elastic as to encompass anything one might like. Neither of these is useful for those who wish to understand what public philosophy is or could be or ought to be and how it fits into the broader field of philosophy or connects with other disciplines and discourses. Instead, I will eventually outline a more complex characterization of public philosophy that encompasses several main senses of the term. In practice, these different modes of public philosophy often intersect and overlap. Um, my proposal is a pluralist one in several manners. I outline a plurality of different senses and modalities of public philosophy, maintaining that it is not reducible to one core meaning or mode. And second, while I hold that these six meanings of public philosophy that I ident identify cover much of the ground of what those engaged in public philosophy mean by that term, I don't claim that these encompass the totality of what public philosophy is, could be, or should be. I expect and welcome that others contribute additional conceptions of what counts as public philosophy. My aim here is to place a proposal on the table in order to foster ongoing reflection and dialogue. So in the time allotted for my paper, hopefully, I intend to do five things. The first is to discuss this recent rise in interest in public philosophy and why public philosophy is viewed as important and timely. The second is an examination of definitions or characterizations of public philosophy provided by several organizations and researchers devoted to it. The third is to propose a deliberately pluralist approach to public philosophy. The fourth uh, proposes an outline of six main meanings or modalities or dimensions of public philosophy. And then I want to close by raising but not resolving uh, some issues, the ongoing need to actually draw some boundaries and make evaluative judgments about public philosophy. So the first thing, uh, Lee McIntyre, one of the originators of the Ask a Philosopher booth and co-editor of A Companion to Public Philosophy, a recent volume, suggests that when it comes to the term, the notion that, and the practice of public philosophy, it, this is what he says, it's more than just the philosophical profession having a moment over an enlarged view of what counts as philosophical and who counts as a philosophical audience. Instead, in his view, we're seeing what he calls a full-fledged acknowledgement that public engagement is now returning to the rightful place it had at the time that philosophy was founded. And this might be a little optimistic of an assessment, but several things do seem fairly evident. First, in recent years, there certainly is a lot more philosophy being done, discussed, and disseminated in public ways. Just to make, take my own modest case as an example, last night I spoke about Anselm of Canterbury as part of the Philosophy Eats series at the Women's Club of Wisconsin and posted an interview about Anselm's thought I gave the Dogs with Torches podcast. Um, I regularly read posts by and sometimes engage with colleagues on Twitter who are considerably more engaged with public philosophy like Helen Cruz, Brian Van Norden, or Donald Robertson. 
Uh, if you spend much time in philosophy connected circles and sites online, you'll see more public philosophy content than you could possibly take in. In the past, not a few professional philosophers have evinced suspicion of some of the activities falling under the rubric of public philosophy, and perhaps rightly so. Worries about a lack or loss of rigor, of debasing philosophy by popularizing it, these have been long expressed and perhaps dissuaded some from engaging various non-philosophical and even non-academic publics. But times are changing, admittedly not always in ways great for the profession as it's been traditionally conceived, practiced, and reproduced, but there are several factors coming together in the last several decades that constitute significant opportunities for public philosophy in the present. One of these is the general condition of the academic humanities increasingly needing to provide justifications for the ongoing work and even continued existence of the profession to those outside of it. A second is a need, a desire, a demand that is palpably out there among at least some members of the general public for substantive but accessible engagement with ideas largely unmet by popular media and culture and also academic institutions. A third is the incredible potential reach the internet penetration of our world now affords, allowing one to find and reach a public online at relatively low costs. A fourth factor is one highlighted by uh, C.E.T. Nagoyan in his Manifesto for Public Philosophy who notes, if you don't have any training and you go online looking for philosophy, you can actually understand, nine out of ten things you'll find are from what he calls the hate web. The number might be off, but he highlights a significant issue. If philosophers aren't providing philosophy in ways accessible to and of interest to the public, people will get highly distorted facsimiles of it from others. So we can perhaps agree that without replacing or supplanting philosophy as traditionally done, taught, fostered, published, and conceived within academic institutions, there's a role and need for philosophers engaging in public philosophy. But then we have to ask, well, what is public philosophy? And another remark that Nagoyan makes sets the stage well, he says, I just spent a couple weeks at a philosophy workshop for public philosophy, and I came out convinced most of us have an incredibly narrow view of what public philosophy could be. I think that's quite often the case. So numerous definitions, or at least accounts, of public philosophy have been brought forward over the last two decades. Some of these attempt to encapsulate what public philosophy is within one formula. So we'll look at a, a few of these. Uh, others adopt the approach of delineating multiple core elements or dimensions. Uh, all of them make some reference to a public considerably wider than just philosophers as an audience, and perhaps even include other people as peers and participants. So one of the uh, commonly referenced definitions in the growing literature provide, uh, is that provided by Jack Russell Weinstein in his essay, What Does Philosophy, What Does Public Philosophy Do? He says, public philosophy denotes the act of professional philosophers engaging with non-professionals in a non-academic setting with the specific goals of exploring issues philosophically. Uh, not bad. Michael Burroughs provides a, what he calls a stipulative definition of public philosophy as a philosophical practice that engages and or collaborates with stakeholders beyond the academy towards the end of improving our community. So now we see an ethical goal there. Uh, Lucia Ziglioli offers another public philosophy is best understood as an activity that aims to promote rational thinking in anyone it can reach. Public philosophy is a catalyst for thought. Massimo Pigliucci and Leonard Finkelman write that public philosophy refers to a heterogeneous set of developments that have taken place over the past several years, broadly characterized by a conscious attempt on the part of uh, a professional philosophers to engage the public at large. Now each of these attempts to say succinctly what public philosophy is and highlights uh, some important aspect but doesn't encompass the totality of what we call public philosophy. So maybe what we need are characterizations that are a bit more specific by encompassing multiple modalities. And Sharon Mager and Alan uh, Fader's two, 2010 report, Prob Practicing Public Philosophy, which was uh, in an APA Committee on Public Philosophy sponsored meeting, 
uh, recommended the creation of the Public Philosophy Network. They noted that there were three main positions that the participants tended to articulate. One was public or philosophical practice as a public good. Uh, and then the second was public philosophy having the explicit aim of benefiting public life. And then third was public philosophy as liberatory, assisting and empowering those who are most vulnerable and suffer injustice. So this is very ethically oriented. Uh, Michael Burroughs and Desiree Valentine suggest public philosophy can take many forms. And they talk about applied ethics and field philosophy, philosophy outreach, service learning. And they propose three main divisions, field philosophy, popular philosophy, and activist philosophy. Um, Ziglioli's review of the recent uh, 2022, a companion to public philosophy, which calls the volume a collective attempt to provide a meta-analysis of what is at issue, suggests there's at least three possible ways to understand the relationship between the two poles of public and philosophy. These being, uh, number one, activities essentially performed by professional philosophers to bring philosophy to non-professionals. The contribution is to that the public can make to the work of philosophers, a very different notion of public philosophy there. And third, the public and the philosopher working together in a mutual and reciprocal relation in order to deal with issues that concern the community. And he construed, they, these are construed as a form of public education, an antidote to epistemic injustices by incorporating people who've been left out, and a form of cooperation with and for the community. Then we can look at what organizations, people who have the proverbial skin in the game, have to say. So looking at the APA, Committee on Public Philosophy, the Public Philosophy Network, and the Connected Public Philosophy Journal, and then the Institute for Philosophy and Public Life and the Society of Philosophers in America, if you peruse their stuff, you will find no definitions of public philosophy. Lots of characterizations. Um, and so you know, we can look at them. The APA committee declares their belief that the broader presence of philosophy in public life is important to our society and our profession. And here's where the meat comes in. Aims to find and create opportunities to demonstrate the value and social usefulness of philosophy, and then they outline nine different activities that they want to engage in, most of which actually amount to finding media outlets that will publicize what, what philosophers are doing. So that's not great, right? The Public Philosophy Network aims to support philosophies, as they say, as they engage the public working with professionals in government, business, healthcare, promoting community discussions, teaching in schools and prisons, writing for the popular press, and through skill building workshops, organizing scholarly conferences, providing mentoring, facilitating network building, and assisting with projects. So we've got a lot of stuff packed in there as sort of characteristic activities and aims for public philosophy. Their affiliated public philosophy journal website, quite interestingly, suggests that most attempts at public philosophy take two forms. One is articulating philosophical ideas in popular terms and through popular media, or orienting itself towards the practical by engaging in a variety of applied studies like business ethics or environmental philosophy. And the public philosophy journal claims that they are fostering a third modality, a collaborative activity in which philosophers engage dialogically with activists, professionals, Scientists, poli policymakers, and affected parties whose work and lives are bound up with issues of public concern. So that sounds very good as well, right? Uh, SOFIA, the Society of Philosophers in America, uh, they have a mission of using the tools of philosophical inquiry to improve people's lives and enrich the profession of philosophy through conversation and community building. Much greater focus on the collaborative nature of philosophy. And they align their, their work with four core values, uh, public philosophy, building uh, philosophical community engagement, philosophical inclusiveness, respectful communication, and then professional excellence and public relevance. Um, the Institute for Philosophy and Public Life's intention is uh, that they declare is bridging the gap between academic philosophy and the general public, incredibly vague. Uh, doesn't tell you an awful lot, but their contribution to public philosophy involves 
as they say, cultivating discussions between professional philosophers and those with an interest in the subject regardless of their experience or credentials. So you see a lot of common themes emerging, right? And, um, you know, it should be evident there's no agreed upon definition or even delineation of the main functions or types of public philosophy. But there are recurring features referenced, um, just no general consensus on precisely what counts as public philosophy. So maybe what we need to do then is recognize that there is a legitimate plurality to views on what constitutes public philosophy that are articulated by those who engage in or advocate for it. So a pluralistic approach doesn't require that we quip, let a thousand flowers bloom and regard anything someone calls public philosophy as just equally valuable as any others. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit um, so I can set out, we have five minutes, uh, these, these uh, six main modes that I would say we could distinguish. So, um, this came out of an earlier Sophia meeting uh, here in Milwaukee, where we discussed the nature of public philosophy, distinguishing five main modes. And then I think there's another sixth mode, which is what we're doing right here, right now, which is metaphilosophical reflection on well, what is public philosophy by people who might be interested in or engaging in public philosophy. So historically, the term uh, public philosophy was uh, used in first in the, the, the first kind of um, sense, philosophy intended and carried out in the public interest, right? So Lippmann's book is a prime example, John Dewey's work, you know, where he talks about public philosophy would be doing that. And so, you know, ancient philosophers certainly viewed philosophy as a field extending into the public sphere, in, in, including the political domain, and we have, you know, contemporary representatives of this, like Peter Singer, Martha Nussbaum, Massimo Piccolo, or Jürgen Habermas, philosophers do engage in uh, all sorts of analysis and argument and advocacy, and they do it in things ranging from books to op-ed pieces or interviews. And I think this is what a lot of people think of, like the Public Philosophy Network tends to think of philosophy, uh, public philosophy in this way. And then we also do have, I think, a legitimate uh, extension of philosophy into the, all these other fields as applied philosophy. So some of what we do academically could be, you know, if we teach a business ethics class, that's applied philosophy. Uh, insofar as we're impacting people who are going to carry that out, we might be doing public philosophy even in the classroom. But there's a lot of engagement by public philosophers with other fields. Uh, an example of this would be philosophers providing you know, useful reflections and arguments and guidance about artificial intelligence in, in the present. A third distinct modality of public philosophy involves philosophers popularizing philosophical arguments, problems, positions, and themes, making them more accessible for the general public, hopefully promoting a kind of literacy about ideas. Um, that's also done through a vast variety of media. There's also a fourth modality of, of public philosophy, namely philosophy produced and provided and engaged in largely by non-philosophers, people who don't have academic credentials. Um, people not trained or working as academic philosophers may be interested in philosophy and carry out independent study, research, and even produce writing or other media. There's online groups proliferating throughout the, the internet that involves that. And then Sophia actually promotes another thing, that, which sometimes gets called philosophy side by side, where you've got the philosophical practitioner, and then you've got other stakeholders, and they're working collaboratively with each other, not holding the philosopher to be the ultimate expert, but engaging in some sort of work together. And then we've got this sixth thing that I mentioned we're doing here now, hopefully, and uh, which other people reflecting on public philosophy are doing. I want to close by throwing out a problem for which I have no solution, or rather a set of problems. So um, those involved in conversation about public philosophy, I think, share several assumptions, namely that it's, it's legitimate, valuable, and needed. There's no consensus definition. The term covers a number of distinguishable modalities, but also that we can make judgments of better and worse. 
and that uh, some people on some bases should be better judges of this. And this is where we get to the sticky stuff, right? We also probably want to say that some products and, and projects, even if philosophy is invoked by them, they're not public philosophy. So a great example of this, all the fake quotes that you see circulating on the internet where you've got like Aristotle's head and something he didn't say, you know, then uh, there's entire sites that are just devoted to churning this stuff out. I don't think that's public philosophy. I think it's using philosophy. Even if they get the quote right, I don't think that's public philosophy. Now, we have to draw lines. And this is where it gets really tricky, right? Um, we don't have any consensus, even within the portion of the profession engaged in it. We have to make judgments of value. And we also want to presumably avoid uh, discouraging people from being interested in or engaging in public philosophy by being too elitist in our gatekeeping. So it's a tough uh, thing to, to try to work out. And this is, certainly has been a problem with the organizations that are involved with and fostering public philosophy. There's a lot of gatekeeping that has happened in the past with the uh, you know, public philosophy network, which has gotten somewhat better now, or the APA committee, or, or some of these others, including even Sophia. And there's other related problems that I'll just very quickly highlight. Um, Shane Ralston raises this, this issue of a romanticization, romanticization of public philosophy that whitewashes the dangerous reality of doing public philosophy. You can lose your job. You can get in trouble, uh, especially now as, as we see legislators uh, considering the issues of what can be taught in classrooms. Helen de Cruz also points out that public philosophy risks or already is an oligopoly within pop culture. So I'm just going to end this here. <laughs> and, uh, it's kind of messy, but hopefully there's some ideas in there that people can grab onto. And I don't, I don't actually have all the answers to these th sort of things, but I think that it is important that we you know, think about uh, the, the breadth of what counts as public philosophy and how we could have standards that are at least permeable to non-academics, or even people who are you know, within academia. Um, oftentimes, it's people from elite in institutions with lots of money who decide what counts as public philosophy, and how can everybody else from non-elite institutions get involved. So that's all I have. Uh, I'm happy to entertain any. It doesn't have to be questions. It could just be suggestions. Or We have about five minutes for questions, and okay. then we can put it into practice by taking it outside the academy. Yeah, I'm happy to talk with anybody lunch. at lunch, you know. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if you could offer any comments or if you have any worries about the line between entertainment and public philosophy. I know it's a yeah. between a poll about young Americans today about who they would think of as public philosophers, like <laughs> Stephen Pinker, I know. Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, but there's tons of philosophy in those kinds of thinkers, but they kind of seem to blend it with some other ulterior motive to sell books or to promote a different political line. What do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that um, they're not particularly entertaining. Uh, Sam Harris perhaps more so than, than Peterson or, okay, yeah, yeah. or um, uh, uh, Pinker. Um, and a lot of what they do is like bad philosophy, right? Yeah. So it, 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 in a way it provides, I mean, you see this all the time in Twitter. Anytime Peterson tweets something, there are professional philosophers weighing in, and they're like, and then here's one reason why this guy is like off base on this, which you know they can provide a nice context for um, engagement, you could say. But it is a, it is a genuine problem. That's what uh, Nagoyan was pointing towards is, you know, if people who aren't taking philosophy a bit more seriously aren't going to do public philosophy, then we see the field to. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think Pinker thinks of himself as an entertainer. Um, but there is like a definite, let's, let's think about the lowest common denominator public, right? So it, it, I, I don't have more than that as a, a solution to that other than, well, we should just keep running into the breach. <laughs> you know? with, with the example of actual philosophers commenting on George Peterson's Twitter posts, I mean, there could be some sort of value in that where yeah. people who are interacting with that material will also see those comments and then have a stronger baseline for what modern philosophy looks like. Yeah, and it can open up like the possibility of, uh, oh, I better go read this thing over here. I mean, a lot of, we, in the, the modern Stoic movement, the main person that like 
comes up with this is Ryan Holiday, right? Yeah. And yeah. so there's lots of people who will be like, oh yeah, I read Ryan Holiday's book and he's so great. And you know, you're like, well, some of the stuff on his on his site is actually mistranslations, and a lot of this stuff is kind of it, it, it's not like reading the actual text or the better researchers who do popular work out there right now, like Massimo Pigliucci or Donald Robertson, or even Chris Gill, who's very, whose academic work is very accessible. And I always put it, when, when people are like, yeah, but I, it, it's you know, nice and digestible, and plus I feel like a sense of loyalty to him because this is how I got into it. I'm like, I mean, if you ride a bike, sooner or later you take the training wheels off, right? Um, why would you just keep going back to something that's not to go to you know the, the issue about why do we study philosophy? Because there's something there that's substantive and you know robust and that can change our lives. Why would you stick with this kind of second-rate stuff, even though it is quite popular, when you can you can be doing this and you can you can do it with people who are competent, <laughs> um, understand the material, and can present it in a accessible way. You know. Yeah. Okay. Um, he had to say oh. it first. Well, then go ahead. Uh, thank you. So I think, um, uh, thank you for your uh, interesting talk. Um, I think to the philosophy is to um, actually to force one's thought to its limit. Okay. Actually, this, when philosophy is defined in this way, yeah. Always it. Um, Confronts the common sense, and it sometimes it defies the common sense. Yeah. But actually, um, and 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 and, and all the, this kind of like um activities always requires like one's like um courage and also right. like yeah. they, and not, not only they need like um like rational faculties, but also they need like consistent effort and yeah. courage. But I wonder actually um if the masses have that kind of like courage and the um, like the they can act, they can pour that kind of cons consistent effort. Yeah. Because like um for example like in the Republic when Charles Marcos said like the uh, justice is just like the, the strong advantage. Yeah. yeah. yeah it, it means the justice is just that that absolute it is it depends on the um, Kind of, it's arbitrary, and, yeah. and when the masses heard this kind of fact, can they really um, like tolerate? Or because like they they um, yeah. depends on the common sense, and their common sense tells that the justice is justice. It's absolute value. Yeah. So yeah. so so my answer to that is there is no such thing as the masses to begin with. There is a vast variety of different kinds of people. And some might be, you know, only interested in common sense. Uh, but I think when you actually do public philosophy, it's extraordinary to find the hunger that people have, and the ability that ordinary people, non-philosophers, non-academics, have for grasping these sorts of things and even committing themselves to it. Uh, one of my interlocutors, who I've been you know, talking to for about seven years, um, you know, began as as a kid growing up in uh, Birmingham, was passed through school, had to learn to read in the army, but eventually got himself to be able to read uh, you know, works that he wanted to, including Heidegger's Being in Time, which he's read through like seven times. Um, if he can do that, other people certainly can. And I think that um, you know, the philosophy about pushing limits and stuff like that, sure, that's one definition of philosophy. There is no definition of philosophy. We have a whole bunch of different types of philosophy. And some may be more amenable, you could say, to doing public philosophy, and some, some probably less so. And there's topics, too. I mean, it's going to be hard to get some people really interested in certain topics, and then there's others that are quite easy to, to get people into. But you can go beyond just the realm of common sense, even with those popular topics. Yeah, I have to break it down for you. Okay. So, well, if anybody has any questions or suggestions, I'm happy to, to receive them. And I don't want to hold people back from lunch, which is... A, I'm looking forward to it as well. So, thanks very much.